Hello, everybody. I hope everybody is doing uh, well on this fine day. It looks like it's going to be a, a beautiful day out there. Um, I just wanted to go over this little thing I saw over the internet this morning when I was doing my little, you know, catching up on the news or whatever. And uh, I hope you remember that we talked about Chernobyl, that nuclear um, power side power plant that, that failed in Ukraine and all failed in the when it was the Soviet Union and now Ukraine, a you know, newer country, is in charge of keeping that place nice and safe for a thousand years. And it looks like uh, wildfires are about to engulf it, or it could possibly. It's about uh, 0. 0.6 miles away, so it's less than a mile away from the plant itself. And there's a lot of stuff um, out there. So if you just put in um, Chernobyl wildfire, you'll get this article and a couple other articles and read up on it. But it's, it's scary because there's like, it's not only just the plant itself. There's like old cars out there and there's a bunch of trees that are nuclear waste. I mean, it's not only, I mean, the plant itself is a mile away from the fire. There's fallout that is actually burning from this and releasing some of that uh, toxins into the air, which is the way it is. It's called... Uh, the laws of thermodynamics, it's in the trees. The radioactive waste is in those trees. And it's also, and then this, this article talks about some of the cars that have been left there, the infrastructure of the houses close by. So just because the plant itself, that's encased in concrete right now to keep uh, the radioactive waste out, um, is not burning, um, doesn't mean that there's not some dangerous stuff being released due to this fire. All right? Um, what a crazy world. I mean, it's just, you know, we started this semester with um, Australia being on fire. We ended it on, you know, we haven't ended it yet, but uh, we ended on a huge worldwide pandemic. And now the nuclear power site that uh, went bad 50 years ago is now threatening the world again. Um, who knows if this, what's going to happen here, okay? Uh, but it just and it's interesting how everything is interrelated, um, you know, and they talk about this as climate change. This, this article talks about climate change, how it's getting drier, and we can't really do proper forest management out in that area because if we go there and clean up the forest and do what we usually do, um, you got to die of radioactive waste. You know, 20 years later, you'll have thyroid cancer or something. You know, that's not a good thing either. So, uh craziness craziness out there all right so uh we are talking about urbanization uh our, our cities right uh and how we're going to well today we're going to talk about the spread of urbanization and uh why we need to watch it and what influences it okay um and sooner or later we'll talk about uh the, the final part of this about building sustainable cities and how we do that um but it's interesting to watch through time uh, what is happening? This little video here is actually a time frame, a time lapse video of uh, Google Earth, all right? And this place right here is Dubai. It's in uh, uh, by Saudi Arabia and stuff. You can see how big this is getting. They're building these little islands. It's funny. They're actually building in this country little sustainable islands out here. Uh, for people to live and just relax on. I mean, these things are like, you know, it's supposed to be sustainable, I should say. Um, that's what they call it. But it's just to give people more room because you can't really build out here. And then this is more, more advantageous. But these places are really neat. I mean, they're, they're pretty darn fancy, but they got plenty of oil money, right, uh, to do those kind of things. And when I watch these kind of little uh, timelines videos, um, you see how big this is getting due to damming? And they need to collect all the extra water for the population growth. Amazing, all right? And this is Tibet. So this is all that water that we just saw across the Himalayan mountains. Um, where is this one? This is Kuwait, another uh, big uh, infrastructure build here in Kuwait. Look at the canals that they're actually trying to bring in uh, to the city. I mean, this is the, one of the biggest debacles, which is the aerial sea. Um, one of the biggest water sources out there. And it has just disappeared over time. When I look at these Google things, I wonder what America would look like. If we had Google uh, Earth way back when, could do these time lapse videos of the building of New York City. And how big that actually uh, created. Look at how big this dam got. 
See, when we talk about dams, uh, the ecological damage and how it displaces things whole, the guacamole, that's huge. That's a lot of displaced um, area, right? So all that land is just not being reclaimed by the dam. But hey, we need the water for the irrigation. All right? It's going to be interesting to see. Uh, this is in Ghana. Um, if farms crop up around here in industrial, because we'll see another video right here coming up pretty soon about how once this happens, then goes the uh, cities. All right? The, the urban sprawl around that water source. All right? Because this is Australia. Okay. Getting that peninsula out of here, this little area. I'm looking at it. Unbelievable. South Korea. Look how big this Nothing was here. And all of a sudden, look at that. They filled that in with land. And I don't know if these are shanty towns or uh, good uh, industrial parks. Okay. This is uh, Russia. Doing another dam project here, all right. And you can see how things actually build up around this dam once it starts. Okay, this is Mongolia, and here they're doing uh, mining, all right. So Mongolia has a lot of minerals. That's about all they really have, and you can see how they're doing this mountaintop removal, strip mining. Okay, and here's a dam in Brazil. So once that dam, this is the example I was talking about. Once that dam builds up, you'll see how the industrialization and urbanization happens. Okay, because now we got the waterways and electricity and all this good stuff, all right? So I always wonder what, uh, if we had Google Earth way back when, if we would see what uh, America did, or even Europe, you know? Um, one of the reasons urbanization has stopped in the developing countries is because we basically ran out of land. So what if we had Google Earth during, like, the medieval days and saw the rise of the um, European cities and how different that has changed? Right. It's amazing how man has influenced the environment, but that's what environmental science is all about, the study of man, man's um, impact on the environment. Okay, So we left off on um, talking about developing nations having a, you know, the developed nations, like I said, have kind of like stopped uh, some of their urbanization because they kind of ran out of room. And uh, developing countries such as China and India and the countries in um, Africa are now developing, and they are the ones that are actually growing the most out there. Okay, and most of the time, the environmental factors that influence the location of urban cities is basically you know location, location, location. If you buy a good waterway, we can have some good transportation in and out, and ship goods in, ship out your climate biome all these different things um, you are going to want to put your city there right and that's because it's driven by economic growth the easier access to have trade and commerce with inside your city the bigger your city is actually going to get that's why New York City is so huge right it's a great port right and we can get all that stuff from Europe over to here nice and easily and then it can be dispersed throughout the continental United States. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth is uh, another example of a growing area. Texas has is, has one of the biggest uh, growing populations in America, believe it or not. And Dallas Fort Worth area prospers um, from not just having a good location. They grew because they had a good natural resource, right? The oil infrastructure out there, fueled by uh, Fueled by the internet and uh, the highway system, right? So we had a lot of good oil wells out there, derricks out there. We get that oil um, out of the ground nice and easily, and we built an infrastructure to transport that oil all over the world, and that helped that city actually grow. So it's not just because of you know having a good biome or close to waterways and transportation. It's also where your natural resources, the wealth of nations. Uh, things. So in the 19th and 20th century, economic activity forced many people to remain in the cities despite crowding and poverty. So there was no place really to go. All right? um, the cities just began to build up and um, the jobs that were once promised uh, weren't as, as uh, prevalent as they were before. So by the mid-20th century, people began moving into the suburbs 
um, searching for better school space and cheaper real estate. This is what really started the industrial revolutions expansion of the urban cities. All right. So there was a lot of uh, crowding in the open cities so that the wealthier individuals that could afford it started moving out beyond the cities and setting up that ring of suburbia around the city. So now if you look down on Google Earth, you'll see the city, then you see the uh, suburbs on the outside ring, and then you see the rural areas on the outside ring of that, and then we bring our food right into the suburbs and then into the cities. Um, and this led to a rapid decrease in population and economic decline in the cities. And cities didn't like that. They were losing their tax base, right? The wealthier um, individuals are the individuals who want to buy a house. I can't say that they're wealthier. They just had money to go out and buy a home. Um, and uh, they went out to the cities and that lot, lot decreased the tax revenue for a lot of those cities, right? And you need to be able to build the infrastructure and, and pay for those roads. Okay, um, Portland is a, a prime example of this. Portland followed a trajectory in the 1950s and the 1970s, but experienced revitalization um, following the passage of land use laws. All right, so they changed their land use laws to um, increase um, the city's we um, city's outreach or city's reach in the outlying areas. And increasing road networks and using of cars has spread human impact across the landscape, creating what's called sprawl. So here is um, the population of Portland in the hundred thousand uh, in the hundred thousand. So way back when they didn't even have a hundred thousand people in Portland in 1850, right? And it wasn't until about 1900 where they got to a hundred thousand people. Okay, and you can see the growing train of the economy, and it kind of flattened off here. For a while, they had an urban growth boundary was adopted here, right? Because it was expanding, and they said we're going to shut it off, uh, keep our wildlife reserves, and it kind of the uh, population growth stalled out, right? And they said, hey, we want to bring in more people, revitalize our city, get more tax revenue in here, so they increased the outreach of it, right? And lo and behold, the population um, increased once more. So the sprawl of spread of the low density of urban, suburban and suburban development out of the urban cities. So here you see Las Vegas, Nevada, right? So back in 1986, this was the size of uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And now when we look at the satellite image in 2013, we see how big this has gone, all right? So we no longer have, I guess this probably was sand at one time. Now we have green grass for the lawns, all right? Imagine how we have changed this biome of what grows there and how many people, right? This is all driven um, by the Hoover Dam, believe it or not, okay? Sprawl results in a development uh, that uh, places homes and spacious lots across large areas of urban centers. So the sprawl is basically brought to us by the uh, homes, okay, our suburban planning. Um, the average Chicago suburban residence takes about 11 times more space than one used in the city. Because city, you can think about it, we're living in apartment buildings um, stacked on top of each other. And these single family home residence takes up a lot more space. All right? And this used to be the farmland that once surrounded the city. And then we had these land use changes to maybe be able to make Hanky Farms into now Hanky Farms residential area. There are two components that contribute to sprawl, right? One is the human population growth. We've got to have some place to put these people, okay? And the per capita uh, land consumption. So how much land are we using per person, all right? Sort of like our ecological footprint, okay? But most of this land use now is, when it comes to cities, is using for housing, okay? Economists and politicians have traditionally argued that sprawl thinking that growth is all Always good, right? We always say that growth is king, and um, you know, if we're not growing as a nation, meaning consuming more and more products, right, and getting bigger in our population and all that stuff, okay. Our, if our GDP does not go up, we're no good, all right. But uh, many are beginning to feel those negative uh, aspects of sprawl, all right, because we can't keep up with it anymore. Um, it's becoming harder and harder 
to innovate our way out of our inefficiencies. So what is wrong with Sprawl? Why, why is it a, pro a problem? Sprawl contains transportation options, constraints transportation options, especially when forcing people to own their own vehicles, spend much more time in to due to commuting and distances. So one of the biggest complaints in the world is uh, people waste an hour of their day or two hours of their day commuting back and forth to work and we have to use our own cars to do that. And that takes up a lot more energy. Uh, Pittsburgh, you know, it's kind of unique due to its geographical um, ecology out there. A lot of uh, yeah, mountains and you know three rivers and there's no such. I always say there's no such thing as such a thing as a block in Pittsburgh. Our public transportation is very lacking. All right, we got one trolley system that goes out to South Hills. Nothing out here by the airport. Uh, for me to get a bus, I have to go to uh, Robinson Town Center uh, to pick up the right cl closest bus to me. Um, so our public transportation is spread out due to geographical reasons. Um, geographical constraints, okay? Um, but we still have to spend a lot of time doing that and uh, to get back from, from work. And this creates a lot more pollution out there. Um, and remember when we saw that one video before um, in the beginning of this uh, presentation about how the older cities were more packed in, right? That per the density per um, acre per person was a lot tighter because they only were able to walk around all right now we got our cars to get us back and forth we actually built a whole society on the car right in the 1950s the, the highway plan to build these suburbs was actually a policy for the united states of america to implement and we built this infrastructure for us okay so cars directly release uh carbon dioxide nitrogen sulfur and Fluvents, uh, pave areas, cut off runoff from many of uh, salt and motor and oil. And oil. I mean, it, the building of our highways was a great thing. I mean, we really were able to interconnect everybody. But our dependence on the car may actually be our downfall, as we talked about with um, oil, right? Where we're going to run them on. Sprawl also promotes physical um, inactivity as driving takes place of walking and daily errands, right? Because we used to always just walk around or walk to the trolley and catch a ride on the trolley or what have you. Um, today, we tend to be, people say, we tend to be a little bit lazier, right? Um, look at that one uh, podcast we talked about with the people. Uh, one guy c complained about energy inefficiency. He complained about uh, how people are picking up the groceries now, all right? You know, I... I I don't know about that. It's it may actually save people time, and it might be a really a good idea. I've done the energy return on investment on it, all right. But to go to the grocery store and not take that time to get that exercise, to walk around and get your own groceries, is a sign of um, physical inactivity, right? As more land is also developed, less land is left for the forest, fields, farms, and ranch land. So most of our primary uh, agricultural land is actually underneath a lot of these cities and suburbs that we would grow on. Everybody's backyard could be you know, a prime place to grow a garden because that's typically um, some good agricultural uh, land, especially in the suburb of areas. Okay? Funds that are needed to maintain downtown, downtown cities, um, centers is instead spent on extending the roads, sewers, and water systems, outlaying areas, and providing um, other amenities. So there was a time in America where we used to always promote the growth of the cities, and then we switched it to the growth of the suburbs, and our cities declined, and now they're complaining that the suburbs are getting too much uh, money, and the cities aren't getting enough money. It's an ongoing battle uh, between the localities and whose streets get to be maintained and whose don't. So today what we've tried to do is create what's called a livable cities. All right. Um, so the future is bright on this aspect, but I have no idea where we're going to go because it's actually, you know, um, it's up to each locality, each um, local district to decide how they're going to design their own cities. Um, and we do this through uh, the policies of the local government. And you can affect this by going on planning, um, 
cleaning um, committees and sitting there and giving you a two-minute little speech of what you want to be done in your community. All right. So city planning, also known as urban planning, uh, provides advice and solutions regarding development options, transportation needs, public parks, and other matters. All right. Washington D.C. and its earliest U.S. and is the earliest U.S. example of a city planning, which architecture. I can't even pronounce his name, Charles, planning diagonal avenues and grid streets and allowing spaces of the movement. So Washington, D.C. was definitely um, set up on a grid, right? It, there is definitely a design. I don't know if you guys ever seen how uh, Washington, uh, the, our capital, Washington, D.C., was actually designed, right? Um, it's basically designed on the, uh, who are those guys? The um, tradesmen, some, I can't, uh, Masonic trade, uh, but if you look at it, how the the uh, White House is where it is, and uh, uh, state capitals, the House of Representatives, and the Senate building is where it is. It's all set on a certain type of grid, all right. And it was one of the first major cities ever built here in the United States, uh, known to use the city planning. But all cities use the city planning, all right. Um, a city was built according to its plan, to his plan, and in 1901, a commission added efforts to beautify um, Washington City and restrict the uh, heights of buildings. All right, so here was the grid for Washington D.C. Right, and no building is allowed to be built bigger than George Washington Monument. Right? Believe it or not, I think that is the tallest uh, building in the area, and that was to keep the uh, the skyline clear so you can see the important governmental buildings out there believe it or not um, we also have what's called regional planners that do similar work but across larger geographical areas and they may cover more than one municipality so you know we need to connect to the, the in ecological economics we always say the micro the macro is only as good as the micro um, so we need to have all these little tiny cities also work together to create that web um, of resilience between the two cities. And you know, something happens in one city, we can kind of you know, work together and try to overcome a problem or work together and share resources. Okay. So there's city planning and there's also regional planning. And this is kind of the stuff we do in uh, sustainable building design. We try to, um, you know, not only do just building of a building, but also planning of a, um, a city and how we make it more sustainable overall. All righty. So I think we're going to stop there for the fine time being, and then we will talk about um, sustainable cities and zoning codes and how we actually plan for these sustainable buildings, uh, sustainable cities in the next uh, presentation. All right. Let me see that. That'll work out pretty good. All right. So anybody has any problems, make sure you give me a, drop me a line via email. Remember, uh, the test is going to be next week. Okay. I'll probably post that on Monday. And then our final thing, I talked about that too, will be the week after that. So everybody stay safe. And don't forget, uh, get your homework in if you haven't done any. Um, you still have time to do that until the end of finals week. All right, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.